Welcome to Trial Site News Podcast Series. Today we have Dr. C.J. Barnum, Director of Neuroscience at Immune Bio, Inc. Dr. Barnum is a neuroimmunologist with broad expertise across neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases, holding multiple positions in academia and industry, including Emory University, FPRT Bio, Sonos Bio, and most recently, Takata Pharmaceuticals. Now, his focus has been on translating inflammatory therapies into clinical treatments for neurologic diseases using a biomarker-directed approach. The good doctor has been working with XPRO 1595 for more than a decade, first at Emory University and subsequently as a consultant for FPRT, Bio Inc., and Immune Bio before joining Immune Bio full-time back in 2018. Dr. Barnum's research has been supported by the NIH, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and the Alzheimer's Association. So, Dr. Welcome. Thanks for having me. The, the pleasure is ours. So I'd love for you to, to give our audience a bit of a background on Immune Bio. Why did you join this biotech company and what is the big promise? Yeah, so I joined Immune Bio in 2018. Turns out that the CEO and I, RJ Tessie, I've known him since uh, my Emory days back in 2011. In fact, back then he was with FPRT Bio and we were really trying to develop this drug um, for neurologic disease. Well, back in 2011 and 2012, and you talk, told somebody that you were gonna you know, treat a neurodegenerative disease with an anti-inflammatory, they looked at you like you had 12 eyes. Now it's everybody's best idea, but back then that wasn't the case. So I've, I've known RJ for a long time. And that really started when he, uh, his company, FPRT, licensed the drug while I was at Emory. And I was doing most of the, cl- the hands-on laboratory work. So my introduction with this drug is, is really in a lab, working hands-on. Um, and then, uh, you know, at some point, it was very obvious that this was, this was a qualitatively different product. And, uh, and I, I worked with RJ to, uh, to move this forward. He had started a company, Immune Bio, with, uh, with another group in 2015. And, uh, and shortly after that, uh, we were able to bring this asset on board and, and uh, all the plans that we had in uh, 2012, 2013, we, we started to implement it. So we've been thinking about this for a very long time um, and it, it just finally came to fruition. Now, you're a leading biomarker expert in psychiatry. Can you share with our audience about the importance of biomarkers in precision therapies? Yeah, I think the best example of that is cancer, right? The, the, the success that we've had in oncology is because we've, we've used biomarkers, we've sliced it down. Even in, uh, you know, if you take breast cancer, for example, there are biomarkers of different forms of breast cancer and different therapies tied to that. And that has really led to the success. At this point in neurology, and, you know, whether it's um, uh, neurodegenerative disease or psychiatry, it's been in one size fits all. Um, we haven't used biomarkers. Now, in Alzheimer's, we use biomarkers like amyloid and tau, but, but that's actually the definition of the disease. You, if you have amyloid and dementia, you have Alzheimer's. If you have dementia and not amyloid, you have dementia. So, so I think the concept of biomarkers hasn't really been utilized very well in neurodegenerative disease. And, uh, and to me, it's pretty simple. Uh, so we have a, an anti-inflammatory that I think we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a little bit, but our idea is simple. If you have an anti-inflammatory, the patient should have, have some evidence that there's inflammation, right? If they don't, why would you, why would you target that disease? So, uh, so by targeting biomarkers, at least in, in, in the oncology space where we've learned, we know that we can, we can increase our success rate. We can do shorter trials with fewer patients and that does a couple things. From a company's point of view, it allows us to move through the clinical development program faster and get on the market uh, and, and have a, potentially a high response rate. But more importantly, what it does is I'm not including 100 or 200 or 300 patients in a clinical trial that aren't going to benefit from my therapy. Let them go work with another company who's, who's got a therapy that really deals with their mechanism. And so I think, it, uh, I think we're getting there, um, but it's, it's, been, it's been slow. Now, I want to talk to you about neuroinflammation and some of the other indications that your company is developing targeted therapies for. What do patients have to look forward to should you be successful here? Well, so, so hopefully we can either prevent or modify their disease in a way that stops it at its current rate or prevent them from developing it. You know, the, the, the interesting thing about inflammation is, uh, and there was a study that was published in 2019 
um, by, I think it was Nature Medicine, um, by, by a large group that suggested about 80% of, of all mortality and disease is driven by the immune system's response. So inflammation is, is, a, is, a, is a mechanism that drives development and progression of disease in many patients. And in fact, as a company, we view inflammation as a disease and things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, depression, um, uh, what have you, as symptoms of the underlying disease of immune dysfunction in patients that have that immune dysfunction. And then beauty is we can measure that with biomarkers. We can identify those patients so that we're making sure we are targeting those patients specifically. Now, for our audience, could you share more about the innate immune system, uh, about what the innate immune system is and how immune investigational products utilize the precision therapy approach to trigger the body's innate immune response to target neuroinflammation, uh, as an example? Yeah. So there are two parts of the immune system. There's the innate and the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is, is really what I would say the vast majority of immunologists work on in research labs. It's, uh, it's very complex. There's a lot of moving parts. It's what vaccination go, uh, deals with, the, uh, the adaptive immune system. But, and to, the, to a great extent, the innate immune system has, has been, been ignored. But what's interesting about the, ADA, the innate immune system, it's the oldest immune system. It's the first one that came online. It's the surveillance, it's the front line. And interestingly enough, there's, about, there's a vast percentage of organisms that don't even have an adaptive immune system. They only have an innate immune system. And that innate immune system really protects them from viruses and all these other things. So, so the innate immune system, it, it's shocking how it's, it's been ignored in a way for the, for the adaptive immune system. And that doesn't mean the adaptive immune system, we haven't had success. We had great success in things like cancer and, uh, and even things like MS and that sort of thing. But it's, uh, as, as uh, my CEO likes to say, it's kind of like uh, they're, they're, they're two hands and you're, you're only fighting with one hand right? When you're going after the, the uh, adaptive immune system. And what we're doing is we're, we're actually bringing both hands to the fight. Um, and, and we think that when you target the innate immune system, that's the sort of thing that, that, that goes and drives um, dysfunction down the road. We know that if you have a dysfunctional innate immune system, the adaptive immune system becomes dysfunctional because the innate immune system actually uh, drives the, the conversation, the communication between the two. So we think that by targeting the, uh, uh, the innate immune system, um, we can not only change um, the, the broader aspect of the immune system's sort of normal functioning across different organ systems, but we'll also have a role in the adaptive immune system um, as well. And so our goal really has been to focus on that um, and, 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 and change it in a way that makes sense and normalize it in a way that helps patients. And I'll make one more comment about that. Um, we know by the time you've reached your third or fourth decade in life, your immune system is becoming dysfunctional. Uh, this, is, this is the concept behind things like inflammaging and immunosenescence. I mean, they're whole uh, diseases. This is an innate immune problem. And these changes in innate immune function and, uh, and inflammatory factors actually are the best predictors of neurodegenerative disease, cognitive decline, um, compared to even things like amyloid and tau when you start looking at these long studies. So, so this, is, uh, this is something that starts early. It's something that has uh, very important consequences for health and disease across all different diseases. And, uh, and, uh, and it's important to target it. But how you target it is as important as targeting it. Now, your company recently received a $2.9 million NIH grant to test the, a new hypothesis that neuroinflammation plays a major role in treatment-resistant depression. We know, that the, we know that the funds help support a phase two clinical trial at Emory University School of Medicine and University of Alabama. Could you tell us more about this fascinating research? Yeah, so thank you for asking about that. This is, you know, this is work that was generated by Andrew Miller and Jennifer Felger at Emory University. And I got to know them when I was at Emory. This really began percolating in, in 20, 2011, 2012. And what happened was, is, is Andy published the first study showing that if you gave patients with treatment resistant depression, a TNF inhibitor, they got better but they only got better if they had elevated blood biomarkers of inflammation. 
And the really interesting thing about this, this wasn't a fancy inflammatory biomarker that requires you to go to the one lab in the world that can actually run this assay. It's actually a biomarker that's used every day in every clinical lab all over the world, it's something called C-reactive protein. And it turns out that C-reactive protein is a really good marker of general inflammation. And the nice thing about CRP is uh, because it's been used in this laboratory uh, over time, we've got some nice norms. We sort of understand what normal is and what isn't. Now it's changing a little bit, but we can actually use that to identify patients and select patients that may be eligible or may respond to our drug. And the beauty of that is if that pans out and that's true, that's the, the translation into the clinic is very easy. I mean, there's nothing that needs to be learned. There's nothing that needs to be done. It's already implemented. But the study itself is interesting for a couple of different reasons. Number one, they've identified a biomarker that, that predicts response, which is C-reactive protein. So you can select patients based on, on a specific value. The other interesting thing is after that study was done, Jen Felger, who works very close with Andy Miller there, started looking at the neurobiology. And what she discovered was that inflammation was tied to a very specific region of the brain, a brain that connects the striatum to the prefrontal cortex. And that pathway uh, subserves motivated behavior um, um, in something we call anhedonia. Anhedonia is the lack of pleasure, lack of interest. So, you know, when you get sick, you know what happens, you, you know, maybe your favorite thing to do is go play football, uh, you know, flag football down the street, right? Um, you would have no interest in doing that. Uh, that's, that's, that's this reward pathway. And what she found was that as you ramped up inflammation, the connectivity between those two areas of the brain go away. So not only do we have a biomarker to select patients, we now have identified a biomarker in the brain that's tied to the behaviors that are most uh, uh, reflective of inflammation, which are things like anhedonia, motivation, um, and we can measure that in a very short period of time. So what we've done is we designed a very short study, six weeks, where we take patients that have inflammation. We also have another interesting biomarker I'll talk about in a second. And then we actually look at the biology change in connectivity between those areas. And the idea is that we should see an increase in connectivity as we give the drug. And this is unique because right now the way these studies are done is they're uh, you know, even if you do have a biomarker, which very few in psychiatry do, you're looking at some clinical endpoint. Um, and, and the clinical endpoint for, for depression is really messy because there are so many symptoms. There are 205 symptom combinations that will get you a diagnosis of depression. And I don't, th and we don't think that all mechanisms work on each of the different uh, symptoms. So, so we, can, we can really guide our, uh, and tailor our therapy towards the patients that we know have changes uh, affected by inflammation as well. The other biomarker we're using to select patients besides C-reactive protein is we're selecting patients that have symptoms of anhedonia. So anhedonia is one of these symptoms that is just tied really tightly to inflammation. And so we think that by selecting patients with both the biological biomarker and the behavioral biomarker, we'll be able to find a much more homogenous group. And the reason I say that is, even though we like CRP, the problem with measuring uh, inflammation in the blood is that it sort of waxes and wanes over time, right? It's not stable, it's not linear. When you look at the brain like a, an Alzheimer's patient with a PET scan uh, and you, you look for amyloid, amyloid's not changing, but the, the immune system's dynamic. So it sort of comes and goes uh, uh, over time. And so you want to make, to, in order to make sure that you've got a really nice, reliable biomarker, the anhedonia is there to sort of supplement it. And I think the combination of the two will really help us hone in on the right patient. So in six weeks, we should see changes in biology. We're also measuring the symptoms that are specific to inflammation. And we've got the more gross, broader uh, depressant symptoms too. But this will really help us determine whether we've got a good program that's based on biology and will allow us to move forward. Now, will recruiting patients in these precision-based studies be different? Will patient enrollment be based on levels of inflammatory biomarkers and and anhedonia uh, rather than all comers study? Yes. So, so right now, <laughs> the approach is you, you take all the patients and you, you just sort of throw them in. And to me, again, I think that's 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 crazy, right? You want to align patients to your mechanism of action. We're using the biomarkers that we know are either associated, the behavioral biomarkers like anhedonia, 
uh, and that are responsive to anti-inflammatory therapies, at least in the past, which anhedonia is, and using um, biomark blood biomarkers that we know predict response. So to give you an example of how important that is, in Andy's study, he showed that if you selected patients based on CRP levels, right? So let's call it CRP above three. They got a 72% response uh, to the drug. Now to put that into context, the response rate to antidepressants across the board is about 30%. So the very simple biomarker, you can almost double your response rate. And this is, these are drugs that are actually currently on the market. So the biomarker is just really, really important. And again, if you've got patients that are, are, are lower, the important thing for the patient is they can go do, try another therapy, right? There are other therapies that, are, that may be better aligned with their, their pathology and may be more effective. And we wanna make sure that we're not, we're, we're not capturing patients that aren't gonna uh, respond. Absolutely. Now, back to the company. How is it coming along from a financial and business perspective? Uh, we know it's publicly traded and that the stock price has generally fluctuated between 220 and 2442. And we know biotech sector companies operate in a risky world. Does the company generally have what it needs to progress its drug candidates? So what I can tell you is we've got enough to get us through our programs through 2021. And, uh, you know, as, 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 a, as a public company, especially a small company, you know, we're, 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 we're always operating on a shoestring budget and, uh, and we raise money when we need to. And, the, and we, you know, our thought, our process, our thought process is, is data drives, uh, you know, investment, right? As we produce data and if the data is good, the market will respond. And that's, that's how we, we've, we've, been, we've been operating. But we're, we're very comfortable with um, that we've got what we need to get through the major milestones uh, to raise more money. Fantastic. And, and before we let you go today, is there any other information that you think is pertinent for our audience that you'd like to share? Well, I would encourage everyone to go to our website at www.immunebio.com. Um, we have uh, some really nice videos on there. And if you're interested in treatment-resistant depression in particular, we did a webinar back in, I believe, September or August or September, where we had some, some experts from the field come in, discuss inflammation and depression, and talk about the approach and, and, and how, how they felt this was you know, this fits into the context. We think it was, was very well done and uh, it gives you a little more information than what I'm giving you here. So yeah, please, please check it out. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll link in the description below as well. Well, doctor, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. We really appreciate you coming by. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. The pleasure is ours.